why do we sabotage what's potentially being given to us here as a collective, you know, with all this co-opting and the, you know, and, and, and usually the answer is that, you know, we're, we're ill, essentially we're disconnected and, and there's a malaise that goes through throughout all our structures. But but the, the, the thought that came up at that point, I asked the question where you were talking about that your father was, well, maybe there's a part of us collectively that we don't feel we deserve to receive what's on offer here. Hello everyone, welcome back to Adventures Through the Mind, a podcast exploring topics relevant and related to psychedelic culture, medicine, and research. And with the intention, with the goal of generating into the cultural space conversational artifacts that help to contribute to understanding how we can live with and work through our psychedelic experiences to become happier, healthier better people for ourselves, for our relationships, and for the world at large, knowing full well that it is certainly not the psychedelics on their own that will do that for us, Uh, nor is it uh, fair to assume that they are benevolent. The outcomes will always be benevolent. The capacity for psychedelics to help us in a positive way is easily hindered um, when we get wrapped up in thinking and mindset and models and narratives that don't necessarily serve that goal. So that's kind of the larger, larger intention of the podcast. This episode, oh, and of course, I am your host, James W. Jesso, as always. This episode, you know, it contributes to that sort of desire to create conversations or generative conversational artifacts. And by conversational artifacts, I mean, artifact, it's a thing that's left over from something else. Uh, that had previously happened that had the touch of the human hand upon it. And uh, conversational in the sense that there are conversations that we're featuring. And generally, the podcast features conversations that are one-on-one, and periodically, we feature conversations that have multiple people involved. And uh, those are a special series that I call the Conversation Café. Uh, sorry, excuse me, I call it the Psychedelic Cafe, and it is a slight modification of the Conversation Cafe style. I initially learned this from Gene Robertson at the Illuminal Space Agency, a meta monastery here in the city that I live in, Waterloo. She's previously been on the show. Um, can't remember the episode, but it will be linked in the description. Um, And today we're going to, uh, oh, yes, so (laughs) the Conversation Cafe, the Psychedelic Cafe, is a group discussion that moves through three structured rounds that orients around a singular question. As a quick additional note, as I forgot to put it in the official intro recording, is that because of the style of this conversation, there is a lot of moments of empty space, and those are left in intentionally to give you a feel for the cadence of the conversation as we were participating in it, sort of to add to the ambiance of the artifact, you could say. And as a point of learning for myself, it also turns out that when everyone's mics are muted, it kind of takes away that sense of being all together and introduces a little bit of uh, jarringness to the silence. But um, well, that's a learning point for me. Anyways, that's an aside, and this is an aside, and now it's over. Um, and our guests for this episode are Maria Papaspiru, Renee Harvey, Nir Tradmore, and Natasha Pelgrim. I hope I pronounced all those names right. Each of them are authors or contributors to this book here. Whoop, pardon those noises. Uh, Psychedelics and Psychotherapy, the Ex- Healing Potential of Expanded States, released through Park Street Press this year. And in celebration of that book, which was an excellent read, I have all the authors on the show in order to do this conversation cafe. The question we are exploring is, what is the healing potential of expanded states? And as per usual, 
I have a little um, overture to bring us into the conversation. What is the healing potential of expanded states? It is this question that guides the conversation featured on this episode of Adventures Through the Mind, another psychedelic cafe episode. Our guests and myself together explore this question and, in doing so, explore the power of psychedelics to connect us with ourselves, with each other, with nature, and with a higher order of reality. We explore the narrow confines of a purely medical model for psychedelics, the shallowness and danger of the growing mainstream narratives, and the importance of arriving to psychedelics with beginner's mind. We explore the purge as a healing mechanism, whether or not we can trust what the medicine tells us, how psychedelics impact how we approach death, and what psychedelics can teach us about working with psychosis. In all of this, we also explore loneliness and our longing for belonging, why we end up sabotaging our sh- ourselves from meaningful connections, and the value of sharing our gratitude for each other with each other. And, well, even more points of topics in this conversation, as all these topics in one contained and coherent conversational space is part of what the Psychedelic Cafe, what a conversation cafe can offer. So that is the overture. Our guests are going to introduce themselves shortly at the beginning of, uh, of the actual recording of the, of the conversation. Um, but before we jump into it, I would like to give a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon who make this podcast possible, make my ability to have deep research and investment into psychedelic culture, medicine, research, like basically everything that informs this podcast, be my full-time job, be my full-time work, and have have also enabled me, you have also enabled me to spend the last year writing a book trying to synthesize everything that I've learned over the years working this podcast and being in the scene and my own journey work and, and all the rest into something hopefully that will have positive impact on the world at least. <laughs> that's that's the hopeful hopeful outcome um and so i'm really grateful that uh that my patrons that you have that you have chosen to enable my ability to invest so fully and deeply into this work and this world that i just value so much and have reciprocated the value you've experienced um in that work by helping to financially support the work <laughs> was that a bit jumbled it's kind of off the cuff but i really appreciate it and thank you If you are not yet a patron of the show uh, and you're finding value in it, please do become one. Um, Even something as little as a cup of coffee once a month uh, is appreciated. Um, If you are enjoying the show, you're finding value and you can't financially contribute, that's totally fine. There's part of the the vision, the desire, the excitement about Patreon as uh, as the means by which I earn an income doing this work is that it doesn't... it enables me to not require a paywall for people to experience this content. Other people who are in a good place with their finances are able to contribute and allow not only the podcast to stay independent from the sort of content and curative um, influences of advertisements and needing to thumbs up the algorithms to earn an income, um, but also enables me to keep it free for people. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, so if you can't afford it, don't worry about it. You can share the episode, talk to friends about it. You could spread this content out into the world by having conversations about it. Also, thumbs up. And if you can contribute financially, please do. That's all for the little preamble here. Uh, please enjoy this episode of Adventures Through the Mind, a psychedelic cafe exploring the question, what is the healing potential of expanded states? Okay, the recording is now in progress. Uh Welcome everyone to the Psychedelic Cafe. We're, <laughs> we're gathered here today. Uh, each of you are authors of, uh, of pieces inside of this collection of essays, Psychedelics and Psychotherapy, The Healing Potential of Expanded States, which was an incredible read. Um, and I thought it would be great to get some of the authors together yourselves to have a conversation about what is the uh, healing potential of expanded states. And so we've come together for this psychedelic cafe. Uh, To start us off, we'll go in a circle, in a circle, and each of you will get a chance to speak your name, uh, what you do, and 
the topic of the contribution you had into this collection of essays. And um, according to the, who I see, how I see people on the screen here, uh, we will start with Natasha, Renee, Nir, and Maria. So uh, Natasha, take it away. Thank you so much, James. I'm so excited to be here, first of all, and some of you are familiar to me, so I'm happy to be here together in this little inner circle. My name is Natasha Pelgum. I'm half Dutch, half Portuguese, so this is why sometimes my last name people go like, where is she from? Um, so my piece in the book is called uh, Deep Dive into Bufa Alvarius, and for those that do not know Bufa Alvarius, it's a compound, a tryptamine, a 5-MeO-DMT, and uh, probably dive a little bit into that today. Uh, my background has been very diverse, but I've always had a very curious mind, curious heart uh, from a very young age. And my first experience with psychedelics was at 15. I'm now 42. So <laughs> count to years of exploration of my heart, my mind, and, and my soul. Um, yeah, and I'll pass it on for uh, the next one, who is, I think it was Renee. Yeah, hi. Lovely to be here as well. So I'm Renee Harvey and I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm in Melbourne, Australia. I came to Australia last year to um, help further the training of psychedelic therapists in Australia. And that's what my chapter was about. Um, I have a long history of working in the mental health field and training therapists so currently we're trying to get this going in Australia and most of my involvement at the moment is the, the start of various research projects, uh, running a, a practice and helping people prepare for what we hope is going to be the great opening when we can all have access to psychedelic therapies and get going. And that's all I'll say for now. Hi, I'm uh, Neil Tadamor. Um, I'm a transverse, transpersonal psychotherapist and uh, I lead a psychedelic harm reduction project called Safe Short. Uh, so we do safe spaces in parties and festivals for the last uh, seven years. And we also do psychedelic harm reduction workshops for the open public in, in Israel and abroad. And I also uh, conduct um, research with the Israeli Ministry of Health about the patterns of use of psychedelics and the uh, harm reductions in, in raves and parties. And I also, I'm also starting now a phenomenological study in uh, Haifa University about uh, self-processing and death denial in long-term ayahuasca users. Um, that's it. Thank you. Really happy to be here. It's, it's lovely to be here. I really feel like I'm, I'm uh, with friends and people where we really build relationships over the time that the book was being edited. So it's, uh, it's really nice to see you all and share the space. So I'm Maria Papaspiru. Um, I'm currently in Brighton in the UK. I'm originally from Greece. And I work as a psychotherapist primarily and a clinical supervisor uh, with individuals and, and some organizations. And in the last few years, I have been working with uh, Dr. Tim Reed, who is the other co-editor of the book. And we started with building the book and the last year we've been building the Institute of Psychedelic Therapy. Are uh, really trying to bring the, the the UK professionals under a cohesive kind of structure so we can promote the work and support the development of the work. Um, in the book, uh, apart from co-writing openings and closings with Tim, I wrote a chapter on psychedelic integration in private practice and a chapter on ethics um, around the practice of um, psychedelic therapy and and other matters that are relevant to this work. And I look forward to discussing today. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, we're here for the Psychedelic Cafe, which is a specific structure of conversation that unfolds over three rounds, exploring a central question, which is what are the healing potentials of expanded states? And so the first round is going to be each of us sharing one clear, coherent thought 
on the on this question, and we will move in the same uh, <clears throat> direction. And I'll I'll be a participant as well, although also the facilitator. Although I'm not a writer in the book, I am a reader of the book, so I have that that particular relationship to it. Um, and so we'll go in the same order that we did before with my with myself ending. So Natasha, Renee, Nir, and Maria. Um, and if you're not ready to share your thought, just say pass and we'll come, we'll loop back to you at the end. Um, so yeah, we are now entering into the first, first uh, round of the cafe. So Natasha, whenever you're ready. Mm, thank you. Um, I was thinking about this question and it made me realize that when I started working with psychedelics, um, you know, there was such an emphasis on being expanded states, being only under the uh, taking a substance. And, you know, within my retreats, what I've noticed is that the potential is the state itself. So the healing potential isn't something that is only induced externally, but one <laughs> once you are in an expanded state, that is at least to me in my observation, is that is healing. That's where healing already starts. Because the moment you have an opportunity to um, um, expand your, your, your mindfulness, <laughs> you know, expand this view, um, that is already a healing in itself because we're stepping a lot closer into a, instead of self, into a more, maybe a more we view. So when I was contemplating about this question, it made me also realize about, um, you know, how other states can be induced and trans states and other practices can induce this. And so I'm curious to go a little bit deeper, maybe into that later, but I'll pass it on uh, for now. I think it's a, it's a great question to start with. Right. Thanks. And um, the most important uh, thing for me is the potential for breakthrough. You know, I've worked for so many years with people with very, very difficult um, histories and uh, very, very stuck. And somehow or other, this, the potential of these substances to help people break through those barriers and make changes at an incredibly deep level and, and healing, uh, find healing. Um, it's, it's very, very encouraging to think that um, you, you know, we're in the brink of being able to use this clinically. Um, yeah. So. Um, so of course, there's there's so much we we can say, but shortly, I I would say that I find that psychedelics for the long term, they really, at least when consciously engaged with and. In the, in the, when the experiences are integrated, people have, find their purpose in life uh, much more often than not. Um, and of course, psychedelics can be used without people finding their purpose in life. But when I interviewed mental health professionals for my master's thesis, and I'm talking about people that took psychedelics in very different settings, very different context, unknown dosages, unknown substances, way before they were mental health professionals. Yeah, And I came to interview them about their meaningful psychedelic experiences. And I was kind of hoping for this, you know, uh, uh, people who will model the right way to integrate the meaningful psychedelic experience. And eventually the psychedelic experience, the meaningful psychedelic experiences that they shared sometimes happened 25 years ago in a very, uh, like, non-supportive setting with a very major mental crisis that issued afterwards for months. But from this crisis, they eventually, or, or without the crisis, they eventually found a way to themselves. Yeah, we can call it the, the inner healer. We can call it the organic self. It doesn't really matter what title we put on it, but people found themselves after years of using psychedelics kind of uh, one one uh, interviewee in the research, she said something really beautiful. She said she's an activist of her purpose in life. So I thought it's 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 like a great way of saying how people integrate their, their the meaning into their life. They become activists of their own personal purpose. One person realized that his purpose is taking care of his wife and children and their needs. One person uh, said his purpose is to connect to the movement of the universe. Another one became an artist. Each one and his own purpose and, and mission and vision. And I think 
expanded states can help us get closer to it. So it's, um, it's, it's a question that I think is developing in different fields in different ways from, from a psychotherapy perspective. The, it's it's incredible the unique access they give us to the unconscious, both the, both the personal and the collective. And it really helps us go beyond the defenses, beyond the good defenses, and really access wounds that lay very deeply in into our psyche in spaces that really it's really hard to get any way to get near to. In in psychotherapy, sometimes we can see trails of these spaces but we don't have an immediate way to get to them. And psychedelic experiences really um, create that really incredible opening. And once, once access is granted into the deep psyche, you know, then we have the opportunity to bring this, these uh, rememberings into consciousness and start negotiating them and start rearranging our whole psychic organization, uh, rearranging who we are, how we exist in the world. And, and that's quite profound uh, in many ways. But I think for that to be really lasting, the psychedelic experience in itself is not sufficient and it's not enough. It requires um, containers that help the processing, um, you know, from, from informal to more formal ones, more structured ones. It doesn't have to be a therapeutic container all, always, but a kind of a practice of embedding what has happened and, and often, really, for deep work, it requires repeated exposure to the spaces and the states. So um, there's something w we can speak to as a collective, you know, the, the, the kind of magic bullet approach versus, you know, working with these states in a more um, coherent and continuous frameworks. Uh, something that I've been thinking about quite a bit um, and uh, is definitely in alignment with a number of things that have been said so far is that, you know, like how we understand what it is we're approaching when we enter into an expanded state and thus how that sense of what it is informs how we approach and thus how we walk from or walk out from uh, has a significant impact on what, what the potential of those states might be. And, uh, you know, that in mind, I, I have had a, a deep wondering about, you know, what is going to become possible that wasn't possible before as a consequence of the emerging narratives around psychedelics as tools for mental health. And I use tools specifically because then there's an added level of like what becomes inaccessible that was once possible before when things become uh, cl clinicized and medicalized. Um, and so that's a, that's an open wondering, not a, not an inquiry, not an accusation veiled as an inquiry, but an open wondering. And, uh, that's, uh, that's what I'm, that's my thought for the opening round. So now we go into the second round where there is no sequence. Anyone could speak at any time, um, on anything that feels inspired from the conversation thus far, um, and speak up when ready. I can't, I'll take the plans. <laughs> I'll, I'll get this rolling. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm picking up from the last point um, that was talked about, which is the 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 mental health and and I, as I heard it I suddenly felt how how narrow that space is in a way um, and it took me to what was said earlier about purpose which is uh, a more you know it, it made me think of destiny and soul and you know this kind of deeper forces in us um, so. I, I guess just the vague thought that's there is mental health as the symptom and what's underneath. 
and something about lost purpose as a collective and individual came up and um, I'll, I'll leave it there and let it get picked up. I think I'd, I'd like to say that um, just looking over the chapters of the, you know, everyone that's here, we, we've come from fairly different starting points, but it feels to me like we're all saying basically the same thing. Um, and it, it's almost, for me, a convergence. It's, it's, it's another form of integration. If you come from these different perspectives, I come very much from the mental health field. But I feel like, you know, we're saying the same things. We're kind of moving towards uh, an integration ourselves, I think, as, as therapists, as healers, as people, where we're beginning to kind of incorporate a, a much greater perspective on, on life and on what it means to be human, what it is to be aware and I think for me, in, in, in thinking about training therapists, it's so much about letting go of those structures and being open themselves. I would love to, um, and there was inspiration coming from what Renee is just say, is sharing, um, is, and I refer to that also in, in uh, my chapter, is uh, one of the realizations in this space, and I think, I've stopped counting about three years ago, but probably I've reached over a thousand people that I've been able to serve. So my inner, my inner data is a lot. <laughs> um, and, you know, one of the things I mentioned in the book is what I started realizing, especially from an alternative uh, point of view, you know, the energetic work with the medicines um, and what that can do in that space. And one of the things that I've realized very quickly uh, in the beginning when I was trained in, with my teacher, how can we actually create, especially within a bufo ceremony, because it's a one-to-one -one, uh, session and not necessarily a group session where everybody's taking uh, like with psilocybin or maybe San Pedro or with ayahuasca. Uh, and I was seeing missing the group aspect and um, the actual healing of sitting together in that space. And it evolved naturally uh, how I personally invite in the rest of the group to send energy of loving kindness and meta meditation into this space for the individual. And I started seeing that while you're witnessing someone else's journey and someone else's healing process, it started opening up the individual a lot deeper through compassion, being able to create a connection to their own pain or a wounded place. And that we aspect starts in to evolve because the, the retreats that I organized, we have a five week program before it for preparation and integration in total. And I started re seeing more and more and more that this giving, this we started feeding into community started feeding into contribution and slowly and surely people stepping out of being in significance into a contributive state and community state. So I'm Renee and, and what Maria are speaking into, it really inspires me to the importance. Yes, we're doing this self work and how can we help navigate that we go from self to other, you know, how, how can we give back to this humanity? You know, and this is, this is the inspiration that I was picking up on. Mm. I, I really love what you, you're saying, and it resonates with a lot of experiences I have uh, working with uh, groups while supporting people in, in expanded states. And even how these expanded states and the compassion we cultivate to their own situation and uh, how it resonates within us like the connection that is formed between the team members of of the harm reduction sitters which is I, I think i didn't mention before what i wrote the chapter in the book about so it's so, also something i'm mentioning in the book and the chapter is uh, basically about the uh, psychedelic harm reduction peer support and the first uh, steps of integration and i'm really uh, and yeah talking there and mentioning it how how uh, just supporting and being around these expanded states and kind of tuning into it, how it creates a very strong bond between, between the team members. Uh, yeah. Uh, something that I have been thinking about a lot, uh, writing about a lot recently, um, 
comes from the work of Darsha Narvaez, uh, who works with the neurobiology, neurobiological development of humans, like evolutionarily, um, and how that impacts um, our psychosocial behavior and how it impacts our even our morality. And one of the things that she presents is that we as a species require connection. We require a nest that we're born into that provides certain components that all contribute to a type of connection that wires our neurobiology appropriately. And then we mature into adults with a properly developed neurobiological system, which leads us to be compassionate, which leads us into what she calls the, the cycle of cooperative companionship. But that without those things in the nest provided, that, that system doesn't turn on line in the same way. And we end up in a different cycle. She calls it the cycle of uh, competitive detachment. And she proposes that essentially we no longer raise our infants in what she calls the, the evolved nest and that the nest is degraded and the consequence is our neurobiology isn't developed properly. And so we actually live, and this is my kind of interpretation, we, we, we live in a perpetual sort of sense of being disconnected, literally all the way wired into how our, nerve, our neurobiology responds to reality and to ourselves. And that that disconnection harms us and we harm each other as a consequence through it. And so there's been a lot of talk about purpose and connection and coming together and the healing. And so I'm, you know, one of the things that I see as possible with expanded states or potential with the expanded states is really like a return, both you know, experientially, but and then socially, but also neurobiologically, the opportunities are sort of like rewire in the sense of like, oh wait, I am connected. I'm connected to you because we're in this journey together. I'm connected with this thing that is bigger than myself called humanity or this thing that life itself emerges from called nature. And, and that that sort of starts to shift and change the, the, the damage that we end up doing onto ourselves and onto each other that comes from our perceived sense of, of disconnection or biologically, socially, psychologically, and all the, the negative impacts of that kind of perceived isolation and, and disconnection has on ourselves and society. Yes, I think it's it's a it's a real challenge when I think about working in a clinical situation is to keep in mind the origin of these uh, medicines where they were embedded in community, they're held within circles of people, and how you replicate this in a clinical situation is terribly important, especially where some people's attitudes is therapy is not necessary. Well, you you need to kind of get back to just giving people a, a pill to substitute an antidepressant. Um, I think it's very important for us to widen that out and to bring in those connections um, into the work we do at every level. The word relational is really important in, in, in the model we're trying to build with IPT and, and the idea is that really it, it, it's in everything. It, it's, it's, it's really... The, the glue between everything, it, it holds everything together or not, or yes, in dysfunctional ways. Um, you know, I, I think it always does, whether that's a functional way or not uh, is another matter. So, um, you know, e echoing what Renee is saying, you know, and also what Renee was saying earlier about the old structures, uh, Yes, how, how do we bring relation, relationality not only in, in the context of the people we, we help in the wider communities, but also these substances themselves, whether they are plants or, or not. You know, one of the questions that comes up sometimes in um, spaces where, where we consider the work, uh, whether in training or in supervision, one of the questions is, is, is there permission to use a certain substance, you know, do, ha, has the plant or the substance given permission for a certain practitioner to actually um, be the the in between? Um, and and if one is to look for that permission, where and how should they look for it? You know, what would that look like? I, I am thinking. It oh, sorry. Go ahead, Nir, go ahead. 
Um, I was thinking about uh, holotropic breathwork and how uh, I think there is, um, I hope Shannon wrote the chapter about the, about the holotropic breathwork, right? I, I, I was hoping she will be here, but Marianne. I think, Marianne, so I think, I think often there's like an overemphasis in talking about holotropic breathwork, about the hyperventilation. And I think we have the tendency uh, as scientists, as therapists, as researchers, to kind of find a very clear biological explanation to what is going on. And from my experience with holotropic breathwork, and I have quite a few sessions behind me, both as a supporter and, and, and as a breather, I'm, I'm basically a student in the growth legacy training in, in Czech, Czech Republic, and I'm co-facilitating workshops here in Israel with a trained facilitator. And I think mostly what is happening there way beyond the hyperventilation is the permission you were talking about. And this is why it came to my mind. There is a, a, um, a permission to, to meet different parts of ourselves and to express them together. And I, I see how people breathe and each person is breathing differently. And although there is an invitation to breathe deeper and faster, there is also, it, it's also said that like each one will breathe according to what he feels right. And from the moment the music starts, like forget everything I said, yeah, the, 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 the one who leads the training says. Um, and I think like sin, since people go sometimes extremely quickly into a non-ordinary state, and I maybe later in the conversation, I can share some people's experiences, but people go into a non-ordinary state very, very quickly once they get this permission to be there, to be in an expanded state of consciousness. And I think it's an aspect of non-ordinary states that is quite often overlooked. I think I would even go as far as saying that the substances are often not as meaningful as we think they are, more of like our intention to expand our state of consciousness um, and be in a very supportive set and setting. And I think in holotropic breathwork, there is a very, very strong uh, relational aspect of, of, of this work, of working in pairs of a sitter and, and breather. Um, yeah, so just some thoughts about the, the permission, how important it is and how mind altering it is, just the fact of, the, having this permission. I love the permission statement, Maria. <laughs> um, it's um, one of the things that um, I personally do as a personal practice. And I think this is where we can bridge a lot of practice, of shamanic practice or from curanderismo, where you place an offering. You know, you create an altar where you honor the space you're going into, you create uh, something that is out of the mundane to start a process of permission. You know, if we, <clears throat> if you are just there to take, you know, what are you there to give? How do you speak back? How do you uh, create reciprocity in the process? How do you, and it's not only in the expanded state when you take something in, but it's the, it's the whole around. It's the wholeness of how you conduct yourself as a human in relationship to anything in nature. And one of the, my teachers um, said from the Hopi tradition, you know, she years ago, she said to me, if you see a beautiful flower, that's great. You can tell her that it's beautiful, but what are you giving back when you pluck it away? And I've always contemplated, you know, and I said, like, yeah, but I don't have anything in my pocket. I don't have anything, you know, and I made this answer. I don't have anything. Well, then give one of your hairs. You know, so it's always something that I still do 10 years later, you know, I see something beautiful and I give something because it's all about creating right relationship. It's by creating balance in, in there. And um, I know what Maria is speaking into also going into the medicine and asking, you know, how would you like me to serve you? You know, what are the things that I need to do to be an open channel and to have egoic parts away so I don't come in with preference and identity into the space when I'm serving with clients. And I think this is these are layers of permission um, yeah that's parked inside of me when you name that.
And as the psychedelic world is rushing ahead, there really seems that it's it's going at such speed that permission is it doesn't even have space to come about. <laughs> well, there's there's money to be made, right? Why 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 ask for permission when you can just try to avoid uh, legal consequences by informing through lobbying what uh, type of regulations will be imposed in the future, right? I'll just I'll just add to that because it's sort of like it clearly reveals that I have uh, some what of a cynicism towards what's unfolding in sort of the larger industrialization of psychedelics um, and in the scene of of sort of like cannabis entrepreneurialism and venture capital coming into the next boom um, and then you know wondering about the expanded expanded potential the, the potential of expanded states of connection, of healing, of togetherness, and how much of that is, is, is degraded by a, a profit-driven model. And not to say that profits and sort of like financial reciprocity should not exist, but profit-driven as in the reason for this is money. Um, and that kind of goes back into this, you know, in my opening thing, I said something like, you know, if it's just a medical model, you know, when things are medicalized, what becomes possible that wasn't possible before, and and vice versa, what is no longer possible. Well, what becomes maybe no longer possible when these these substances and these states are seen as opportunities for profiteering, either financial profiteering or even social profiteering, as lots of people are psychedelic microdosing microdosing coaches and all the rest. And I, you know, I present myself as an integration coach, sure. So I'm kind of in there too, in in some sense. Um, but like what what happens to the psychedelic experience maybe in general but certainly to the people who step into it out of out of this sort of these growing cultural spaces i suppose that uh, just to come back to the original question what is the human potential um, we've opened Pandora's box, haven't we? And so uh, as much as the, all the goodness is coming out, we have a lot of shadow things coming out as well. We have to find ways of dealing with that. I mean, in, in private practice, you know, those of us that... that receive referrals from people that, you know, have, have had a, a, a fallout from a psychedelic experience are really seeing what's emerging in response to the wider narratives of, you know, I, 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 I had an acid trip experience and it changed my life and it lifted years of depression and it just uh, sorted everything out for me. And I think on one hand, we're falling back on the medical narrative and paradigm, which is, you know, uh, recovery and healing happens from the outside we don't need to take much responsibility there is some magical solution out there and psychedelics you know are quite magical so it's very easy for them to fall into that narrative and into that box but then you you do have a lot of people out there that suddenly hear about it end up having an experience in ways that are really unsupported or or with psyches that are really unprepared or in a place that's really not the right set for for an experience like that and the fallout is is starting to appear and it's it's not pleasant it's not pretty it's quite scary in, in many cases, and it, it begs the question again, it, it's about the speed, the velocity of this thing and, and the collateral damage that it's leaving behind. And uh, th there have to be spaces to speak to that, you know, to counteract the other narrative, which is just, uh, uh, um, you know, a, a very clean, well-polished product that's on the supermarket aisle, ready to be picked up. I, I have to say that I, I lately found that since psychedelics kind of emerged into the clinical space, they 
kind of became owned by psychotherapists and medical professionals. And suddenly every person that is using psychedelics recreationally is looked at like he's escaping something. He's an escapist. He's not doing it in a professional psychotherapeutic se setting. He's one of these recreational people doing it to just have fun and escape their daily problems. And I think that's, that's a problem. I think that psychedelics are something much, much, much larger than the psychotherapeutic tool that they are. And of course, I have deep, deep respect for psychotherapeutic work with psychedelics. But that being said, I don't think this is the domain psychedelics belong to. They maybe can serve this work, but I think it's a sort of a human right to, to, to be able to expand your mind and, and ingest plants. And I think that knowledge on how to consume psychedelics safely and how to work with the experiences afterwards should be something that is made accessible for the wider public. And I think that this notion that you have to have two psychotherapists, one male, one female, and to have all these medical approvals to, to do that, I think it, it has a shadow aspect of its own. That's, um, it's, it's very interesting because I just had near this same conversation with someone that we both know. Uh, I will leave his name out because I'm not sure if he wants to be named here, but uh, literally two days ago. So I'm just giggling inside. And uh, we came to the following conclusion that the, because, you know, we've seen and I've seen a lot of uh, therapists uh, wanting to be trained in this space. And then they come into a retreat setup and come into a ceremonial space with no experience at all. And that is something completely different. It's a different language. It's a different type of navigation. It's understanding that the one leading that ceremonial aspect needs to be in a trance state him or herself to be able to understand what the collective is going through, maybe not giving meaning, but understanding how to navigate it with sound, with smell, with movement or, or not. And I've seen over and over that um, these beautiful individuals come in and want to learn, and then they realize that they have to start with beginner's mind, and then that's hard because they're already so trained in one perspective and I realized two days ago, I was like, wouldn't it be great if the therapist would be out of ceremony, but around <laughs> for the preparation and integration, and then let the navigation of the ceremony happen with those that know how to be in expanded states from a different perspective. And then each quantum uh, complement each other's skill and, and, and that work. So I don't know if my conclusion will be the same in a week time, but that's two days ago. So I wanted to give at that to the conversation. Well, I think that uh, we all come into this field with our own narrow window of experience. And it's easy to see that, to try and, you know, stick to this, this view that I'm right, where I'm coming from is right, because that's all we know. And I think on, on both sides, there needs to be an, an expansion of, of viewpoints. There needs to be an incorporation. Um, as clinicians, we often have the experience of people who've been in informal situations and haven't come out of it so well. Often these people, you know, if they have a good experience, they go back to that practitioner and that's there's a kind of biased view. But the people that don't do so well end up in the clinician's offices. So I think we have to think and, and I think that no one perspective can be seen to have um, a handle on the whole truth. I think that's when you get into dangerous territory. I, I, I believe, Renee, what you were just speaking to, for me, also speaks to the, the potential of expanded states, which is, and to, to quote Dennis McKenna, not maybe his most intelligible quote, but like, we don't know shit. And that one of the things that these, these expanded states, these substances provide us is the recognition of like, oh, wow, it's so much more than I could possibly even conceive. And what I thought was right and true and, and this and this and this, it's all much more possible as being something else now. You know, like I, there is a whole realm of things that is completely beyond my conceptual grasp and will forever be. And if I got that wrong, I might've gotten some other things wrong too. So maybe I should like 
reel back on the the intensity by which I hold my sort of my ideologies. And in that, I think there's a space for connection with others that might not have been there before, um, which I guess goes back to connection as well. And of course, that expands into the industries that are now using them, like psychotherapy and the medical system. I had a conversation with Rick Strassman at one point, and he seemed pretty convinced that psychiatry was what it was and psychedelics wasn't going to change that at all. Where in my mind, you know, it's like psychiatry has to change if it wants to incorporate not just psychedelics as pharmaceutical agents, but psychedelics as things that do things to people and those things have effects and they mean something about the mind and about what chemicals can and cannot do for a person. I think beginner's mind is important for all of us. You know, I'm always mindful of the Alexander Pope um, poem. I always think about this, which starts off a little learning is a dangerous thing. The essence of which is, you know, the, when you climb to the top of the mountain, you think you're at the top, but when you see all the other mountains that you haven't climbed yet. So I think we have to have humility wherever we start from. Yeah, and I'm not sure if it was first Jiddu Krishnamurti, but this is where I'm remembering it from early in my 20s and, and him saying something like, I don't know, is an incredibly powerful and empowering statement. I had a client once um, that uh, was a uh, real, real psychonaut. And after years doing many different psychedelic substances, um, Mm, the uh, mushrooms actually um, said to him, okay, now that you've done all this work, uh, you have to stop everything because you don't know anything. And then he got really worried. <laughs> so now we can do the real work. And he was like, what, what have I been doing then before this, you know, for the last 15 years? And um, that to me was like a, a good anecdote of, yeah, you know, this is the beginning. Now we're going to start. And, you know, it was very clear the medicine was very clear. You're stopping with this, with this, with this, with this, and you're going back into the drawing room and at the beginning of time. So, yeah, even the medicine circling back to Maria and its permission will tell you, you know, uh, as well, maybe not in all cases. Um, and one of the other things I wanted to add is um, it, it won't always make you a nicer person, this work either. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we hope like this, we, and we have, you know, back to humanity, we're speaking these beautiful things, but I've also seen people come out, you know, actually more inflated in their ego, you know, I've, and more convinced and making meaning of what was said, where, you know, as a space holder, I, I, I never want to make that meaning. I want never want to assume anything about anybody's journey. But I hear the reflections and then I question, wow, what do I have permission for to reflect back here? What their meaning is? Who am I then to say that? It's always a very fine line uh, in that. Yeah. I'm going to step in here because there's Natasha, what Natasha just said sort of, I think, uh, invites invites a, a question, um, and it kind of ties in with my my wondering about you know what is no longer possible that was possible before when things get integrated into the medical model. Maria talking about permission, which is you know that you know the mushroom said to them, the medicine says, right? Well, I mean, it, from what I can tell, reading the science is that the narrative is essentially like, oh yeah, you're accessing yourself. And the chemical is changing your brain and you're having the experience of touching your inner. It's all like self, 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 self. But now we're speaking of like, there's actually an other there and something is coming from that other, which begs a kind of question about what is this place that we're in? What is this reality that, uh, that we're in? Like, so I'm going to stop it there. So I don't try to conclude my own question, but that's something I, I want to throw into uh throw into the circle here if anyone wants to pick up on it. And it's a tricky one, James, because if, if, if I had a, a pound for every time someone said, Ayahuasca told me to do this, and I heard what it was, and I went, oh my God, <laughs> are you sure you don't want to think about it a little bit more? <laughs> Uh, we used to run an integration circle in Brighton and we wanted to print t-shirts that said the mushroom told me to do this 
because the, there's something, um, you know, th th there are some psychological structures, I, I will call it. I'm not quite sure what to call it. That can be quite concrete sometimes and uh, may take something that is said at face value. Uh, and, and I think the same happens when we do dream work. In, in, in personal therapy, you know, someone might come and say, oh, I, um, I, I, I dreamt of my ex of 10 years ago. Does this mean I still like my ex? And, and it, it's, um, you know, it, it takes discernment sometimes with, with these messages that arrive from the unconscious that sometimes are very clear and, and, and very concrete in, in what they have to say. And sometimes we have to bypass the concreteness of the message and really sit and, and bring our responsibility as well into the process rather than uh, dispose all of it to what the medicine told us or told us to do or not to do. So it's, it's yet again another gray area, I think, in many, in many cases. I, I'd like to jump in on that one and say that I think it's kind of maybe a good time to maybe just separate for a second between the different substances and the different non-ordinary states which they evoke and I, I will just speak from my personal experience because like Maria as, as a harm reduction specialist and as a psychotherapist I hear many times like these messages that are coming so-called from the spirit or from things and I, I, I personally find it really hard to believe that uh, like a higher order spirit would communicate such a bad idea for the person as, 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 as the right way to go with. Um, but from my own experience with DMT, I have to say that I have absolutely no, no doubt that there is another order of beings existing, like nothing that anyone would ever show in any neuroscientific study or anything would make me think that what I encountered was not real or something that exists only in my own mind. That was just my experience of, it's kind of made me think of William James. He has this famous quote of the filmiest of screens and this other order of consciousness that exists beyond them. That's how it feels like someone is removing a veil and beyond it, there is something else, another order, and I'm I'm really not here to 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 say or to decide what this is. But I think it's another order of reality, of consciousness, of beings that exists completely independently of my neurochemical reactions in, in the brain. I'll just make the make the comment uh, since I was muted. I'll just be like, "Yeah, <laughs> me too." The 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 issue of language comes up for me, and I I have to say it's something we discuss in in the institute quite a lot, and we discuss it because, you know, we we try to create a space which is multidisciplinary, and the question of language comes up. You know, how do we d different different disciplines? You know, from from psychiatry to herbalism. You know, the the members that are are are, are really coming under a ro one roof are really that diverse. In, in some cases, what is a common language to speak here? And, and it's the same with what we're debating now. You know, what is the language of the spirit and what is the language of some distortion that requires uh, more, more sitting with? And I, I, I think we have a long way to go collectively in, in, in really addressing different languages and, and finding a way to somehow harmonize them or, or allow ourselves to sit with the multiplicity of languages that we're sort of sitting in the midst of. I think that's very important, Maria. It's how you discern and decide where, what the truth is. Because I'm just thinking you could say ayahuasca told me and it could be have the same kind of structure saying, well, my doctor told me. So, you know, if you, you're thinking about the agency coming from outside yourself, 
And how do you know what the truth is? I think it's simplistic to think it's outside, it's inside, maybe it's both. Yes, and uh, another addition to what is already being said here is that from a traditional point of view and within the shamanic work and also an energy work is um, they have they have a preference. They, I mean, the entity, the, the spirit, um, the energy, the guide, they also have egoic structure. And this is something if you're trained from that perspective, uh, you would never give your power away. You know, you actually go into a form of negotiation and go and find out what's the intention of that energy. So this is where um, it's just a different a different uh, approach to what we would do in here in the, our wake state too. Now, if someone would say, give me your keys to your house, I would ask why. So why would I give them away on that side of the veil, <laughs> you know, like, and ask their name. So who do, do you want to enter my house? Who are you? Well, it doesn't matter who I am. It's like, well, it does. I'm not going to let you in my house, right? And those skills that you would do that, it, you know, on the other side as well with those practices. And I think this is where um, that I've heard so many times and, and people making decisions about very important decisions within weeks where I go like, well, if I approach it this way, would you do the same? Um, it's, it's, very, it's actually very important what is being said here. Such a fine line. Yeah. I'm thinking of a, of a personal anecdote, which is kind of silly, um, but sort of speaks to what Natasha was just saying about like a negotiation as one of the ayahuasca experiences I had while I was in Peru. I had the ayahuasca telling me I needed to go explore the purge in my bucket. Um, And so I was like, okay, uh, like there was a, I was like, I don't know. Okay. Okay. Fine. So I go to the bathroom and I like get ready. You know, I got my headlamp on and uh, I'm like looking at it and I'm like, oh, it's all stringy. And I'm like, oh, that's great. Wow. And then I wash my hands and I, and I go to take a, like I'm peeing. And then in my head, the ayahuasca is like, you should explore the, your piss in the toilet. And I was like, no, ayahuasca, too far. And I heard the voice be like, okay, 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 fine, fine, fine. So (laughs) it's weird to see you all laughing and not hear it in my ears. But yes, negotiation. (laughs) I will laugh out loud. (laughs) We can talk about the purge. Yes. And the healing. <laughs> you know, and, and, and I guess one of the, you know, one, one, one of the, uh, again, back to language and different um, uh, sort of backgrounds. And, you know, sometimes they're diametrically opposed to, to what, how, how they see things, you know, and what, what's really interesting is the the idea of the purge as a, as a healing mechanism, you know, the purge as a way of somehow uh, allowing something to leave you, to, you know, to, to completely exist outside your body um, and, and, and a bodily fluid, but at the same time, it's linked with your psyche in some kind of strange way. And, and, I, and I find that really quite fascinating um, that, it, you know, w- w- when you come from this more traditional uh, understandings of what happens in this space, some of the ideas we have as psychotherapists get, get really challenged. It makes me think of, of the healing potential of expanded states specifically for Westerners is just simply the body, mind, spirit unity that for other cultures, tribal cultures, many other people that are not Western, this is a, just a given fact. But I think it's maybe one of the first things that psychedelics remind us as Westerners is that it's, it's, it's all one unity of body, mind, spirit. Wow, that immediately remember. brings me back, uh, very quick, really brings me back to uh, being harmed by disconnection and the healing of coming back into connection. I remember reading a tagline once or hearing, I don't remember if I heard someone say it or read it, but it was the marketing tagline of 
uh, psychedelic mushrooms better than ayahuasca without the purge. <laughs> like, okay, I'm talking, circling back to what James said earlier about the space and how, you know, everybody's, um, <laughs> uh, the beautiful marketing language that's coming into play to, to sell seats. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I, I saw um, there, there was a picture that was circulated. There was a, a, a conference in Miami. I think it was called Wonderland. It was around microdosing, and it, it, it leaves you a lot to ponder. Uh, and it, it's actually quite of great concern, really, when, when you see that kind of really uh, cringy commercialization. And one of the pictures that was sent from someone that was there was a, a, a flyer kind of advert that had a recliner and the universe around. And they said, uh, suffer from depression, suf suffer from trauma, hop on and have a, a ketamine IV infusion to resolve all your problems. And that was part of the conference experience where you could just hop on onto the couch, bring your trauma and your depression along. It will just dissolve through this uh, ketamine IV infusion. And, you know, if, if it has come to that, you, there's a lot for a lot of us to really think about. It is absolutely shocking that it has come to that within a matter of a couple of years. Um, and that this is acceptable, an acceptable way of um, promoting, profiting. You know, that was a extra three, four hundred dollars. You know, you can have this little extra as part of your conference experience. Um, we are in very tricky currents at this point, if this is the direction we're heading towards. It's a question I'm, I'm going to pose to each of you, um, and it's something that I've noticed in myself over the last few years. I worked very hard to get to where I am in my career and in the sort of psychedelic scene and used to push really hard to try to like organize events and be a part of conferences and stuff. And over the last year and a half, maybe this is just a change in my temperate, temperate, temperament as I get older and as I move through my mid-30s into, into my 40s, but I feel like almost almost disgusted. Like, I don't want to be a part of that anymore. I certainly don't want to hustle to try to be a part of it. I don't even like that phrase anymore. At one point I was all about it, but it's like, it feels like, I just feel like I no longer necessarily want to be a part of this thing that for so long was such a deep and meaningful part of what I felt was like my, my way in the world, at least it's, it's public facing persona. I don't mind uh, speaking into that a bit. A bit. Is um, I've um, uh, not been in a public arena for a very long time because of that, uh, because I couldn't find resonance with a very small group <clears throat> that were there and decided very consciously to come up because I was missing vo a specific voice. And when I miss something and I find myself a little bit in judgment, I go like, well, to go and change it, <laughs> right? So that's, you know, what I've been doing in the last few years. And now I'm back to the point, well, you know, I'm underwhelmed. Uh, I'm underwhelmed by the amount of uh, greed and shadow that is showing up in multiple perspectives um, in this space. And I'm realizing that it's absolutely a, a, an honor and a gift to be able to sit in, you know, and, and work with people, to receive people's trust, to for you to be their ally, for them to go into a deep psyche space is an absolutely gift. And I've realized for myself that I'm, you know, uh, stepping a lot more away. And now Tim and Maria, are, you know, with this podcast and yourself, I'm like, yeah, that's you know, feels good in my body. But even if the slightest doubt shows up. I would normally push it more and I'm away. No more conference, no more things. Let me work with a handful of people that I really love and go into that space. So I'm recognizing a, what you're saying a little bit of, hey, where are we moving into? And maybe there is another current wanting to be created by those that are stepping a little bit away. Maybe we feel called into something else, you know, soon. 
So also keeping open, you know, things are fluid, things come and go. Yeah. Yeah, for me, it's something like continuing to do what I think is meaningful for the scene, but no longer trying to be like riding the wave because I no longer like what the wave looks like or where it's going. Um, I, I find myself less inclined to attend a lot of things. Um, the, the, there is a sense that my my energy has also focused around doing the work that I really like and doing the work that I love and the, 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 doing the work that I love, which is really supporting this work in 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 the spaces that I I trust. Like Natasha says that. Uh, actually doesn't have less of a pull. I, I have to say that, you know, during the pandemic, um, it, it's been quite interesting how how fertile that space has been for really cultivating the right scenes and, and watering things and allowing them to grow in that silent space that we've all fallen into. So it was really the time where the book happened, the Institute started building. But it's, it's all about, I think... Um, in, in all this madness, there's also a lot of people that really care about what's happening. You know, in all this frenzy, I think there's a lot of people where their, their heart is in the right place and they really uh, have, a, have a deep connection with these spaces and this work. And I'm, I'm quite surprised to find continuously people that I really feel I can trust and I really feel like I, I, I want to collaborate with. So there's something about remembering that these pockets are still there and the work is still continuing with integrity in many spaces as well. I have to say that I'm like sitting and thinking, well, where do I stand in relation to this? Like uh, part of the living I make is from uh, psychedelic harm reduction workshops, psychedelic integration workshops. Uh, I was, I'm, I'm like sharing this without any integrated process message. I'm just like saying that when, when I think about what I do and myself making, make, making a living out of this, at least partially, I, 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 find that I, I'm very, like, I'm, I'm happy about the focus I have in this world of, of like, making this knowledge accessible to, to more people and reducing harm and whether it's integration or harm reduction, it's all, I would say, a, a part of the same uh, mission. So I, I would say that I, I feel that I, I found the right way for myself to make this in, in the very front I would say of my professional life and, and I feel okay with it. And maybe on the same breath, I, I will share that I, I'm worried about the big companies like Compass creating like analog molecules of psilocybin um, that will maybe be active for three hours instead of six. And then they can save money off paying for therapists, et cetera, et cetera. And I would say that this level of profiting, I, I find it very, very troubling. And maybe time will tell something different. Maybe time will tell that their work is fantastic. I don't know. But I'm finding myself very worried about the level of intervention we do to these processes we intervene in the very structure of the molecules already in order to make this better more efficient process um, yeah it feels like there's something almost inevitable about this this whole process i'm just mindful of um kind of situation of you know the idealistic young inventor that creates a wonderful product 
and then it gets co-opted into military use and all sorts of nefarious kind of um, ways of, of, of distorting the original intention. And I think that um, it's really up to us to keep the connection and to keep our values and try to foster that side of it. I, I just don't feel like we're going to stop any of the other stuff. And, uh, you know, we, we have to try and find our way through the, the best way we can. Um, circling, I, I, there's this question that circles around my my head. I I think we sort of touched on it early on, and it's it, the the question is who owns psychedelics. It's a terrible question. I'm not asking because I think <laughs> it's a good question, but but there's something about the you know the question was what is the healing potential of psychedelics and i guess it's a tricky question because those that get to define the answer to this question might also get to own this space so it's um it's 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 perhaps a question that's best left open than answered in a particular way and from a particular perspective because it seems to bind to them in a in in perhaps in an, an unhealthy way for or, or or in a way that might limit the potential. What Maria just spoke to there uh, evoked questions around um, uh, bio privacy and reciprocity with indigenous peoples as you know western organizations companies you know like the institutionalized structures of colonialism continue to attempt to profit and all the rest off of these molecules out of these plants that had been cared for by other populations for millennia in some instances or, or maybe longer um and those same populations who are being extorted and um you know, even to the extent of genocide or attempted genocides against populations that have existed from the same organization or the same sort of like civilizational force that is now looking to, you know, profit off of their spiritual plants. The, um, uh, uh, his name, uh, not Tucker, Kevin, Kevin Tucker, spiritual extractivism is the term I'm thinking of. Um, and so, yeah, when Maria spoke that, I, I remembered like, oh, yeah, there's like this whole other, you know, quandary unfolding in this, too. There, there's another point of point of a big topic, topic I wanted to, to bring in, uh, and it's death and how we approach death and dying. And I think this is, for me, one of the major healing potentials of non-ordinary states and, and psychedelics. I think it can tremendously help us accept our own death, uh, see death as a part of life, and deal with grief and the loss of loved ones. Um, and I think that it's, uh, it's, it's, we can see like we can see the different psychedelics as, as really teachers of how to die in a way. It's maybe different ways of dying, but I think that part, part of what I, I learned through my psychedelic experiences and many of the people I work with is, is kind of a, just this letting go, this deep letting go uh, and acceptance. And I, I also think that psychedelic integration practices are very relevant for the end of life. I, I had the opportunity to uh, kind of write a spiritual biography with my grandfather the, before he passed on. And it was a very integrative process. And I felt it, it really helped him move uh, forward and to let go and to kind of integrate his life. So I think that in some sense, the way we integrate our psychedelic experiences can be extremely beneficial to, to work with for the last, our last years. It's 
almost like a um, feels like a, somewhere there's an answer to Maria's question. What if death owns it? <laughs> so that was my question. You know, uh, well, maybe I'm going a, a bit too deep with that with that one in a way of <laughs> gloomy, <laughs> gloomy about our humanity. But um, <clears throat> that's my that's been my question for a, for a while, especially in the space that we're now in, so collectively, uh, and such a you know a death experience, what we're going through, and um, yeah, what if what if the plants are you know and the consciousness and the expanded states, and that is the beyond or the great mystery, you know, whatever language we decide to to give it here. Um, what if it's helping us to die gracefully? That's been a question of mine. What are we? What if humanity is dying gracefully through the help of psychedelics? Um, so yeah, it's been something I've been contemplating, and I hope I don't have that answer. <laughs> um, I would turn that on its head and say, what if it's life? <laughs> eternal optimist that I am, I think that life breaks through and maybe it's all part of a great big learning pattern. And, and we have to trust that it is taking us somewhere. Life always seems to break through. Mm, and, and then to, you know, just to riff on that, you know, and, and almost bring it full circle and that death is not a part of life, but in service to life. Because if things didn't die, there wouldn't be things to grow from into life and, and so on. to breed the again threads and fragments of integration and reciprocity we had uh, andrea langlois give a really wonderful uh, keynote in ipd last week which was on um reciprocity biocultural appropriation um, she brought this really beautiful idea where she said that uh, to to integrate our encounters in, in in expanded states is actually an act of reciprocity towards the substances themselves. It's it's a personal way of really saying I have received and I will make use of that which I have received in a way that will be of service to me and to the yes. <laughs> And to the greater whole, it's, it's uh, I think, the most exciting idea I've heard in the last while. It makes me think of Natasha giving a hair back when she picks a flower. To, to receive as well, to, to truly receive. <laughs> Is, is the part of the, you know, to really receive what's in these spaces um, and, and, and open ourselves up to the encounters that are initiated. This is, um, this is a very human-centric comic, comment I'm about to make, but perhaps it has utility beyond humans, which is one of, the, one of the, my favorite podcasts called the Huberman, Huberman Lab podcast. And uh, recently, uh, he did an episode specifically about gratitude practice. And one of the things that he pointed at was that the gratitude practice, the, the gratitude experiences that are most profound, have the most profound impact on how our neuroanatomy is, is wired towards positive affect and pro-social engagement is actually the experience of other people being grateful for us. And so thinking about one of the things I had this thing with my dad one time where I wanted to uh, something about exchange. Like he'd be like, Oh no, I don't need that. I don't need that. I don't need that. And I said something like, do you know how, how good it feels when you give a gift to someone and you see that they're really grateful. And he goes, yeah. I'm like, well, when you deny a gift, you deny that person the opportunity to feel your gratitude for them. And he was like, Oh, that's a good point. And he pulled that on me sometime later when I tried to deny something he was offering. Um, but perhaps there's something there too, you know, that, that the, 
that the expression of gratitude, the receiving with gratitude is itself a gift onto the giver um, as well, which goes back to what Maria might've been speaking to there. It brought a really bizarre thought in my head. I'm just going to share it. You know, the, the thought was, why do we sabotage what's potentially being given to us here as a collective, you know, with all this co-opting and the, you know, and, and, and usually the answer is that, you know, we're, we're ill, essentially we're disconnected and, and there's a malaise that goes through throughout all our structures. But but the, the, the thought that came up at that point, I asked the question where you were talking about that your father was, well, maybe there's a part of us collectively that we don't feel we deserve to receive what's on offer here. Mm, yeah, and, and going back to what I was speaking to about Darshan Narva as much earlier about the degradedness and the, how our neuroanatomy requires connection, you know, like it's not just brain stuff, it's models too. So perhaps somewhere in us, part of that system not turning online is the belief not only that we are disconnected, but that we're disconnected for a reason. And usually that happens as infants and generally infants you know, they're so egocentric as a part of their neurodevelopment. It's like, oh yeah, it's because of me, right? So it's not that mommy has depression, it's that I'm bad, right? And that sort of gets wired in. Maybe it sort of flips later on and everyone else is bad, you know, but like maybe there's speaking to what Maria was saying, like that's now we're going into the, the, the sort of the wounds that we could be healing in, in expanded states as well. It's like, oh wait, actually, maybe I am worthy of being loved. There's a part in the retreats that I offer where <clears throat> uh, in the five-day setup is every single morning and evening at the end of the day, we uh, speak, in, speak in around words. And I always keep it open, you know, for some, it might be prayer, for some, it'll be affirmation, for some, it'll be a gift or a mantra, you know, I don't want to label it, but it's, so I give it a speak in around words about the intention of the day, the gratitude of the day. And it's really interesting that at day five, at the end of the day, when people depart and we still have a few weeks online to be together, people start saying their gratitude, what they almost wish for the integration of another. And it's almost something that they're uh, like little kids at Christmas wanting to do. And it's, uh, it's so beautiful to be able to observe how close and how much people really want it. If we take the labels and the naming out and we just keep it as an open, open playful space. So I'm happy to hear that there's actually research to it <laughs> here. So I'm going, going to look that into and, and send that into the community. But it's, it's, uh, it's something that people still do. We have these groups, we have the community and we have these groups all that siloed together and half a year later, they're still doing that for each other. You know, they're still speaking in round words for each other. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm delighted to hear that it's actually come up, come up here. Yeah. To, to add to it from this, from this same particular episode, he spoke to how that same like neuro neuroanatomy change, those same positive changes can occur when you are a witness of a narrative where, where, where you're engaged in a narrative where you, you experience somebody else going through hardship and receiving things that they're great, grateful for. And so that you can even access that same benefit, not by somebody being like, I'm grateful for you, but watching somebody else in hardship be grateful as a part of a narrative. Um, and so that itself then ties in you know, to what Natasha was saying, because you're in a community and that you're watching somebody else receive it. You're not even involved except by a witness. And you remember the story of that, that itself can have those same positive impacts, or at least theoretically based on what I understand of, from what this podcast was saying. In the, in the last uh, holotropic breathwork uh, workshop we had here in Israel, in the closing circle, Many people referred to, not to their own experience that they went through during the breathing or the sitting session, but many people referred to how touching 
and beautiful it was to see just 30 people really kind to each other for three hours in one space when one person is having a really painful experience experience maybe crying maybe screaming one is laughing one is having a quiet moment with himself within all of this like just 30 people having a very different experience and still being really kind to each other and eventually i felt like this is what stayed with them more of the more than the personal parts that they met in in the journey just this zoom out on the process and how we were all just kind to each other for three hours and how amazing it is I just feel so excited to be like, yeah, we're healing the harm of disconnection. <laughs> but it is, in my experience, the two things that people speak about most commonly after these experiences is love and connection. And, and you know, I think it's easy to lose sight of that. There are bad things in the world and our news media and everything is biased towards bad news. And uh, we, we, we can lose track of how good people can be and the good things that happen. Um, life has all of that in it. And I think we have to keep that broad perspective. There's light and shadow everywhere. One of the things, two, two of the things that people most often bring in, in a therapeutic setting, you know, away from psychedelics is... is I mean, the most important is a, is is a lack of belonging and a sense of isolation. You know, that's just so prevalent in our days today, and that deep sense of being alone with one's experience of life and the world around them, and the the connected you know the the need to belong is is intrinsic is it's it's in our most primal structures it's it's a survival structure it's a non tribal structure that somehow left into our collective psyche there is, there is a very deep necessity for belonging and then people go into these experiences and they find the belonging through the interconnectedness they find the belonging as, as you guys say in the group they find the belonging within the greater order of things you know it's an experience that often tells you yeah you you belong and nothing can take that away from you they belong within nature they belong within the family systems and that's just really tremendous. That can can really um, soften a lot of these defenses and these structures that that keep them isolated and out of belonging. Be because we crave it, but of course, belonging comes with its challenges as well. It's not an easy process in real time. Something something that. Maria, what you were speaking to there that I've, I've experienced in myself and in supporting other people in integration is, is, um, is the, the, the incredible importance of grieving the loss of, like grieving the loss of belonging, like actually getting in there and being like, it hurts, I'm sad, like this is a loss, it's gone. And that that itself somehow can open up a space where not immediately like, I belong now and it's all good, but like from that you know, through that grieving process, something else becomes possible, right? So that, that grief for what has been lost insofar as, you know, what I think we all, you know, are brought into this world to expect, which is connection. And by expect, I mean, neurobiologically, we evolved to be connected. So our, our nervous systems are like, yeah, this is what it is to be alive. And then it's not there. And that's a loss. Sorry, Natasha, please. No, that's, that's okay. Um, also, the, the reverse has been an expanded state. So a, a very personal experience that I would love to share here is the, um, you know, I've done multiple ceremonies in Oaxaca in, with a, a, a Mazatec elder with uh, mushrooms. And on my third evening sitting with that specific medicine, I had a very challenging experience where I felt extremely disconnected. I didn't belong. And I uh, felt um, 
it's not a it's not a loss, but it was really the not belonging and not connecting. And as I was coming coming out of the experience, it was excruciating. Only to later understand that I've as me as I'm natural, I am naturally, I feel always connected. I might not always feel belong, <laughs> but I always feel some form of connection. I'm always connected to myself, my outer world, that what I believe in. You know, there is a deepness in my connection that I experience in my day-to-day life. And in that experience, I got what it means for those with depression or those that don't feel that connection, don't feel that belonging. And for the first time, that expanded state showed me how that actually felt. And that gave me the richness to really understand that depth of feeling, which I you try to be empathic and compassionate and, and you can reach one point, but really that feeling of not having it is as important for someone working with others to fully understand that embodiment, to fully understand what it feels like to be in that space. So yeah, that's an expanded state that gave me a very big lesson in life. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think, I think that that speaks to what has been spoken to a number of times, which is like the, you know, the value of having good integration support because for a lot of people perhaps they come out of that and be like oh i am disconnected like that's 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 what's left resonating and then it also speaks to just like the mystery of this of the medicine you know the and and the intelligence of it the, that word hasn't been used yet but the intelligence of it there too And I think maybe an, another healing potentials of, of, of non-ordinary states that I'm really connected to um, is working with uh, psychosis. And I feel that my psychedelic experiences, first of all, made me understand psychotic uh, patients I worked with uh, much, much better. Um, I, I was working, maybe I should say, I was working as a mental health worker for six years in the psych- psychiatric hospitalization alternatives, uh, like the Soteria Model House and, and other sim- like home hospitalization programs. I was working a lot with uh, psychotic patients, not as their psychotherapist, just as a guide, a worker, a companion. And I felt like, like the psychiatrists and psychotherapists that worked with them really lacked this non-ordinary perspectives of how it feels when reality like breaks apart, when from one moment to another, you're fully connected and engaged and talking to someone. And then a trigger happens, something happens, and then reality breaks and you're alone and scared and everybody's worried feelings are perceived as, as something violent and scary and, and, I've been there. I experienced that. So I, I, I felt like it, it really, really helped me and understand these experiences. And I think that psychiatrists should definitely, it like especially people working with, like psychiatrists working with uh, psychotic patients should definitely know and like experiment a little bit with non-ordinary states. And I also think that our work in the parties and festivals in psychedelic harm reduction and just this model of psychedelic harm reduction, I think it can be huge for uh, supporting first episodes of psychosis and psychotic episodes and, and crises in, in general. Just having this soft, compassionate, non-judgmental space that allows you to kind of bring your experience forward. And I think that that like it, it, within our global mental health crisis, our understanding of psychosis might be one of our worst domains within this field. I I think that the psychedelic paradigm can really bring new life to this space that you speak to near, because, you know, from a psychiatric paradigm where these experiences are, are primarily meaningless 
and they just they're just an illness and they need to be cut out and drowned out and medicated out and just seized the the psychedelic paradigm is bringing another understanding in which says there's a meaning there's a purpose and these processes need to reach their conclusion for the health the psychic health of the individual they need to be supported towards resolution and that they're essentially a, a, an attempt for healing rather than an illness, which is how we say things. So the, the the possibility to, you know, we 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 understand in this expanded states that actually it's 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 not just gibberish. And it's not this just the psychedelic paradigm. I think that was depth psychotherapy, you know, that that started essentially with Carl Jung when he entered his really terrifying archetypal openings and he sat with them and he he used the guides from these spaces and and he harnessed their wisdom and he trusted the inner healing intelligence and he went on that journey and actually his his magnus open cake opus came from there his his greatest work really emerged from what today we call madness and we try to medicate um so they 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 are essentially not only a great experience for psychiatrists to have, but also a, a very new way of sitting, of getting near. Because I think a lot of the medicating and the medicalizing is also a defense. It's trying to not get near because these spaces are truly frightening and difficult to be with. But how to stay near and pay attention and trust. So I'm going to, we're going to close this, this middle round and move into the third, uh, where we will share one clear, coherent, concluding thought. Um, and, uh, before we do, let's all just take a second to have a breath and let that conversation we were having come to a little bit of a, a settle and then I'll initiate it and, and give the sequence of names. Okay, so for the closing round, like I said, we will do one clear, coherent, concluding thought, and uh, we'll do so in the same sequence as before, as I see on my screen, Natasha, Renee, Nir, Maria, ending with myself. Um, and then after that, I'll get everyone to share their social media things. Um, so uh, Natasha, whenever you're ready, and again, you can pass if you're, uh, if you're not ready, and we'll come back to you. Coherent thought. <laughs> um, I'm almost in a psychedelic space when it's not coherent and not linear. So <laughs> not always speaking into it. Um, but one of the things that have stood out in this beautiful circle here together is <clears throat> the richness of how many things we don't have answers to. And, um, and it's really beautiful to experience the openness of understanding we don't have those answers. We're really doing our best to walk in that integrity of uh, honoring the other, honoring the relationship with other, uh, being an optimist in the space while not shying away of death. And I think that the cycle of initiation uh, is what we've spoken to in this circle, um, many different layers. So, um, yeah. I feel it's an initiation process, what we spoke into in the layer. So yeah. thank you for that. Mm. Okay, I think from me, the um, closing thought I'd like to share is that this is about openness and an expanded awareness within ourselves as clinicians, as healers, as therapists. Uh, we, we, we're thinking of the people having an ex, uh, expanded awareness state from the psychedelics. We need to have that in our approach. We need to be thinking and, and. We need to be incorporating 
the vast array of knowledge that we have across the di different disciplines and really working together with this. I think that I'm mostly left with the very various, the many various ways we can invite the, the transpersonal to our lives and how each one of us has kind of his own personal path to do it and kind of each one had, can, has the opportunity of, of meeting his own personal truth through these expanded states. Uh, three words stand out. Uh, four. <laughs> Community and accountability. They feel really important. Complexity and mystery. Um, and I, I really want to preserve the mystery here and, and sit with that because, you know, the, the healing potential of these states is a mystery. And it, some of it needs to remain a mystery and we need to protect the mystery from being demystified because, you know, a lot of life is demystified and disenchanted and that, that is part of what pulls us to that space, that we really enter the mystery and the unknown and it takes humbleness and humility and openness and beginner's mind and, um, and heart and compassion to, to sit in the mystery and, and, and allow it to inform something in us that is a mystery in and of itself. Um, so it's not coherent. <laughs> it's mysterious. <laughs> uh, I think, I think what's, um, what's really left sort of ringing for me from this is just, uh, how much value there is for um, for all of us in coming to com coming back to connection with ourselves, with each other, and with uh, what I think Maria earlier called the higher order of things, and that there's something in these expanded states that that allows for us to, you know, I don't know if it's if it's heal from disconnection by being in connection to connection or if it's healing the harm of disconnection through connection, but there's something in those states um, that, uh, that seems to allow for that. And there may be something about that allowance and, and the consequences of it that speaks to something about the mystery um, that can be perhaps inspiring without needing to be understood. Um, and so that is the conclusion of, uh, of the Psychedelic Cafe I uh, really thank all of you for being here and contributing so earnestly and, um, and intelligibly in, into the space here. Uh, to close, I uh, would love to just quickly go around. Each person could just say your name again and one main link for the listeners uh, who are tuning into this, the, the people who have witnessed this call, who have participated through witnessing, uh, where they could follow up with your work um, if, they, if they wanted to. So same order as before and just speak your name and, and your main main link. Uh, Natasha Pelgrom and um, the link is awakenthemedicinewithin.com. So it's very simple. Renee Harvey and having resisted for so long being on social media, best way to get in touch is LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook. And Neil Tadmo, and uh, the link is uh, psychedelicare with one C, psychedelicare.com for our Safe Shore, the Psychedelic Harm Reduction Project. Thank you. And I'm Maria, and my work really in the next few years is going to be the Institute of Psychedelic Therapy, which is instituteofpsychedelictherapy.org. Thank you. Uh, and <clears throat> all of those links, as well as bios for each of our guests here, as well as links to purchase the book to which all of them are contributors, Psychedelics and Psychotherapy, The Healing Potential of Expanded States, which inspired this conversation today, that will all be available at jameswgesso.com uh, and wherever you're checking this out on your podcatcher or YouTube or whatever. So 
Uh, if everyone wants to just unmute your mic, we could say a sort of real time goodbye. Yes. Um, but yes, thank you thank so you. much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Mm-hmm. Lovely to sit. It was with really, you. really great to be here. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, James. My pleasure. And cut. Okay, thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed what you heard, check out um, Psychedelics and Psychotherapy, The Healing Potential of Expanded States, a book from Park Street Press, released 2021 this year. Uh, And uh, you could also check out any of the guests that you heard here. All of their links are contained in the show notes to this episode at jameswgesso.com com or uh, which will always be linked through in the description to wherever you're checking this out if you're not listening to it already on the website and uh yeah if you appreciated this conversation there are other psychedelic cafes that you can find by searching the psychedelic cafe playlist on youtube or going to jameswgesso.com looking up psychedelic cafe um and you could also look into conversation cafe if you look that up on the internet you could actually be facilitating these types of discussions with your own community which i really thumbs up and encourage it's it really creates beautiful meaningful connections and we could all use some more meaningful connections (laughs) if uh if this if this cafe that you just listened to was not evidence enough um me doubling down on it maybe is helpful check it out um And that's all. Thanks for liking, subscribing, following, doing all that stuff. And uh, if you don't want to rely on the social media algorithms to keep you up to date on what I'm doing, including the book I spoke to at the beginning of this episode, uh, you can sign up for my newsletter. Links to that are also contained in the description to this episode. So that's all. Uh, Thanks for tuning in, and I will see you on the next episode of Adventures Through the Mind. And until then, take care.